As we read the four accounts of the arrest, the fake trial, the beatings, and finally the crucifixion of Christ, we get the strong idea that those who knew him best never took their eyes off of him. <laughs> During the trial, Jesus looks at Peter as he denies knowing him. Jesus looks down from the cross to see his mother and John and others who know him. Even and perhaps especially those who hated him so vehemently were very careful to ensure that they had their man. The Jewish leaders even remembered Jesus' words that he would rise again. So they went to the Romans about it to be sure that some deception didn't occur. We come then to the first events of resurrection morning. And in our session today, we're going to uh, be focusing on Matthew 28, uh, but also some verses to supplement from Mark, Luke, and John. Our big idea uh, this week is that God reveals his greatness through Jesus' resurrection. In two ways, uh, we see his plan, his amazing plan, and we see his purpose, his grand purpose. The disciples who have been so prominent and visible throughout the public ministry of our Lord are almost invisible from Friday afternoon to late Sunday morning. Why would a relative stranger be the one to bury his body rather than his disciples or even the women who had accompanied him? Where are the eleven? We get some, uh, some clues to it from John 19, uh, where John says this, After this, Joseph of Arimathea, a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission. So he went and took the body away. Nicodemus, the man who had previously come to Jesus at night, accompanied Joseph, carrying a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 75 pounds. Then they took Jesus' body and wrapped it with some of the aromatic spices in strips of linen cloth, according to the Jewish burial customs. Now, at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden was a new tomb where no one had yet been buried. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they placed Jesus' body there. Then the last verse of Matthew 27 says this, talking about this very same scene. Matthew says, Now Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. And here's how Luke uh, describes it. He adds a bit more detail. Luke 23 the last couple of verses. The women who had accompanied Jesus from Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it, and then they returned and prepared aromatic spices and perfumes. Joseph, Nicodemus, and these women are far more in tune with God's purposes here than the eleven disciples, and there are reasons why this is so. As we continue to walk through these events, we will find that God reveals himself through Jesus' resurrection. Let's talk about how we see God's plan unfolding here and how it reveals the greatness of God. So, Sunday morning, we come uh, to this part of it. Matthew 28, 1 says, And now after the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Here's how Luke says it in verse 1 of chapter 24. Now on the first day of the week, at early dawn, the women went to the tomb, taking the aromatic spices they had prepared. So by Jewish reckoning of days and nights. Uh, this is the third day uh, since Jesus has been killed. Uh, Bob Utley, one commentator, talks about this term from Luke. Uh, um, Luke says, early dawn. Um, it seems as though the women left 
uh, their home, wherever they were staying, before the sun came up and they arrived perhaps up right about dawn or right after the sun had come up. They had prepared the spices on Friday night. That was the, the evening of preparation for Sabbath day. And I say to myself, more spices? <laughs> Joseph and Nicodemus already had, had brought 75 pounds of spices and wrapped his body. I was talking with Laura about this uh, a few days ago. Uh, why so many spices? And, and she said, well, you know, women, they always think you need more. <laughs> But then her second suggestion, and I think this is very, very good, perhaps uh, that was their gift. That was their gift to Jesus to honor him in that way. And so they were bringing spices to, to anoint the body of Jesus. Constable says, their reluctance to believe is a strong argument for the resurrection. They knew that Jesus had died and been placed in the tomb. When they went to the tomb on Sunday morning, they didn't go to the wrong tomb. They knew where the body had been put. They were there watching when Jesus' corpse was put into the body. Uh, they saw the stone rolled over, rolled over the covering, the door. They were bringing spices to anoint a dead body. Obviously, they didn't expect the resurrection. <laughs> So they would hardly have dreamed it up, right? Made up this idea, this story. Let's go on to verse 2 of Matthew 28. Suddenly there was a severe earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled away the stone and sat on it. I think it's interesting that all four Gospels talk about the stone having been rolled away. But this brings some questions, and we don't necessarily have, have answers to them. But um, the one is, did the earthquake move the stone? Or did the angel move the stone? Or perhaps both? And why is the angel sitting on the stone? Is this another way that God is saying, it is finished? The job is finished? I, I imagine this picture in my mind. And I think this is probably the most fun this angel has had in his whole life. He has come and his task has been to roll away, to move away the stone, not so Jesus can get out, but so that we can look in, right? I think the angel is having a great time and he's just playing around. <laughs> Matthew 28, 3, his appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were shaken and became like dead men because they were so afraid of him. So did the guards faint? Uh, were, they, were they drunk? Like, I don't know, maybe many of you have seen the movie Risen and the suggestion in Risen is that the guards were drinking and passed out. Um, but at what point did the guards wake up? What did they hear? We get the idea from verse 11, when they finally get up and run away, they go to the Jewish leaders. They don't go to their Roman superiors. They go to the Jewish leaders and they tell them everything that they had seen and heard. So it appears that they heard and saw all of it, perhaps. But I love the idea that the earth shook with power. And the guards shook with fear. <laughs> Here's how Luke says it, verses 3 and 4 of chapter 24. But when they went in, this is talking about the ladies now. When they arrive at the tomb, they see that the stone's been rolled away. Uh, when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood beside them in dazzling attire. More evidence here uh, in the idea that they went into the tomb looking for the body. And they were perplexed because they didn't find Jesus' body there. Deuteronomy 19.15 says, A single witness 
may not testify against another person for any trespass or sin that he commits. A matter may be legally established only on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Uh, I read that because there, there are some who debate about the idea of, okay, what, how many women went? Did one go or two or, or four or six? Because there are different accounts and different numbers. Also, how many angels were there? Uh, was there one angel or two angels? Imagine if four of us uh, wrote an article describing Nowruz, the spring celebration uh, here in uh, northern Iraq. Would our articles be identical? They would not. Four of us writing about the same event would all include different kinds of details and different things that we see, and all of it together makes this amazing thing. And so we look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and we get, we, we're gaining the big picture. What's the big picture here? This is more evidence, it seems to me, for the truth of the resurrection. Because if they made up a story, then the accounts would have been identical, right? Everyone would have said the exact same thing. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they all include some differences with how they approach the whole thing. God reveals his greatness through the resurrection of Christ. We see his plan, his awesome plan, and we see his purpose. Let's go on to verses 5 to 7 of Matthew 28. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you're looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised just as he said. Come, see the place where he was lying. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has been raised from the dead. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. You will see him there. Listen, I have told you. And then Luke uh, shares this from verse 5, chapter 24. The women were terribly frightened and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? The angel's words in Luke really stress the fact that Jesus is alive. He's the living one. Uh, it was inappropriate, of course, for them to look for someone who's alive in a cemetery, right? In a tomb for a dead person. And so basically the, the angel's words are, why do you look for the living one among the dead ones? Deffenbaugh says, the women were rebuked for not believing Jesus. They did not have so much trouble believing that Jesus would be rejected and put to death as they did that he would rise again. The women only needed to be reminded that Jesus would rise again and thus they were rebuked for looking for Jesus among the dead. Remember what he said, the angel says. Such strong evidence for a resurrection. Because he first appears to women who, you may or may not know, that women were not regarded as reliable witnesses in that culture. The disciples are secondary recipients of this news, which I believe is also evidence because they would have the most to gain by Jesus being alive or dead. So this makes the news of the resurrection stronger because if you and I had made up this story, we would have had a whole crowd of people there at the tomb and everyone would have um, gone down a checklist and said, okay, yes, he did this and this, this happened and this happened and we would all testify. But... The women were there in this significant time and place, and God had it all planned according to his purpose. Another question, though, arises from uh, verse 7, where the angel says, He is going ahead of you into Galilee. Why is Galilee mentioned so often? We're going to find it again in just uh, another couple of verses. Let me talk about the history of Galilee just for a moment. From 1 Kings 9, King Solomon, building 
uh, his palace, building the temple. It says this, After 20 years, during which Solomon built the Lord's temple and the royal palace, King Solomon gave King Hiram of Tyre 20 towns in the region of Galilee. Because Hiram had supplied Solomon with cedars, evergreens, and all the gold that he wanted. This was the purpose of Solomon's gift. When Hiram went out from Tyre to inspect the towns that Solomon had given him, he was not pleased with them. Hiram asked, Why did you give me these towns, my friend? He called that area the region of Kabul, a name which it has retained to this day. So, the significance of this name Kabul is a little bit unclear, though it appears to be negative. Some people have proposed that this was a play on words because the name Kabul sounds like a Hebrew phrase meaning as good as nothing. This is Galilee. During Jesus' time, it still kind of had this same uh, connotation, this meaning. Uh, think about at the end of John 1, Philip found Nathanael and told him, We've found the one that Moses wrote about in the law. And the prophets also wrote about Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael replied, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip says, Come and see. And then John 7, when the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, are rushing toward uh, Jesus' condemnation and death, Nicodemus says this. It says, Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus before and who was one of the rulers, said, Our law doesn't condemn a man unless it first hears from him and learns what he's doing, does it? They replied, You aren't from Galilee too, are you? Investigate carefully, and you will see that no prophet comes from Galilee. Well, there were prophecies given about Galilee uh, in Isaiah, and then Jesus himself, uh, and so on. Isaiah 1, the gloom will be dispelled for those who were anxious. In earlier times, he humiliated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But now he brings honor to the way of the sea, the region beyond the Jordan, and Galilee of the Gentiles. And Matthew 4, verses 12 to 16. Now when Jesus heard that John had been imprisoned, he went into Galilee. While in Galilee, he moved from Nazareth to make his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah would be fulfilled, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way by the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sit in darkness have seen a great light, and on those who sit in the region and the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Galilee. Why Galilee? Because this was Jesus' home region, right? They had, he and the disciples had had so much amazing ministry in Galilee. Everything began in Galilee. We get a couple more glimpses uh, from, uh, for example, from Luke 23. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no basis for an accusation against this man. But they persisted in saying, He incites the people by teaching throughout all Judea. It started in Galilee and ended up here. Well, then Pilate sends him to Herod. But then in Acts 1... Here we find the angel saying this to the disciples as Jesus has ascended now into heaven. The angel says, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking up into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come back in the same way you saw him go into heaven. Then in Acts 10, Peter's message to Cornelius he says, you know the message he sent to the people of Israel, proclaiming the good news of peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. You know what happened throughout Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John announced. Galilee 
is significant in every way. The disciples did end up going to Galilee to meet Jesus there, but we'll be talking about that in a few weeks. Matthew 28, verses 8 and 9. So they, the women, so they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. But Jesus met them, saying, Greetings. They came to him, held on to his feet, and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go tell my brothers to go to Galilee. They will see me there. And Mark In his story of this, Mark 16, he adds two words to this. He says, but go tell his disciples, even Peter, that he is going ahead of you into Galilee. This is the angel talking. Tell his disciples, even Peter, that he is going ahead of you into Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you. And indeed, Jesus did tell them, uh, Just four days earlier, he had told them the exact same thing. Luke 24, 8 and 9, Then the women remembered his words, and when they returned from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and all the rest. (laughs) God's revelation of his greatness is making things very, very clear for the women and also for the disciples. Notice the progression that happens here. The woman, the women then returned to the eleven and the other disciples with their news. The angels had been witnesses of the resurrection to the women, and now the women were witnesses of it to the rest of the disciples. They, in turn, would be witnesses of it to the ends of the earth. Acts 1.8 This is the purpose of God beginning to be carried out. I love how Jesus rewards their seeking, these women seeking him and obeying the angel by his presence. He appears to them and they worship him. God reveals his greatness through Jesus' resurrection. This isn't a case of people simply believing what they were expecting to see. The evidence is clear. As God reveals his plan and his purpose, we see amazing greatness. These women, they were always seeking. They were there when the stone got moved. They were there when the stone was rolled away. They kept seeking Jesus intimacy with Jesus. I think it's a great lesson for us. We need to keep seeking intimacy with Jesus. When the darkness is closing in on us, keep seeking. When things are as hopeless as they can be, keep seeking him. When nothing seems to be going right, keep seeking after Jesus. When it doesn't make sense, keep seeking Jesus. I love how they were so quickly obedient to the command that the angel brought to them. Obey in the light and the dark. Obey in hope and despair. Obey when it seems that everything is going wrong. Obey when it is illogical to obey. Choose to obey what he's commanded his church. Choose to obey what he has said to you, brother, sister, from his word. Obey what he's saying in this moment right now. And then they worshipped. They worshipped God. When God reveals that it is all true, worship him. When he reveals himself to you, Worship him. When he reveals his power and authority over life and death, worship him. God reveals his greatness through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In amazing ways, he he shows us his plan and his purpose through these events. May we keep our eyes open and 
Be careful to expect great things from God. Expect that God will keep his word. Expect that God will show up when we least expect him. Amen.